Hello friends, welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. I'm John Lomaking. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And if you've joined us each month, we want to thank you for being dedicated to following us and praying for us as we pray ourselves whenever we get a Sabbath School lesson to tackle. And this quarter is the book of Ephesians. Uh, Dr. John McVeigh is the author and the central contributor to this lesson. And it's phenomenal how a book that's only six chapters long could have so much depth to it, mm -hmm. which is the focal point of the inspiration behind it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Before we go into the lesson any further, I want to introduce you to our panel, which you may know most of our uh, panelists, maybe as family members, you may have rubbed shoulders with them, or they may have come to your church. But right to my immediate left is Ryan Day. I call him the singer in Israel, evangelist Ryan Day. Good to have you here, Ryan. Always a blessing to be on 3 and Sabbath School panel. I'm excited to study the book of Ephesians. And I have Monday's lesson entitled, A Riot in the Amphitheater. A riot, wow. Mm -hmm. Shelly Quinn, the lady from Texas who has so <laughs> many hats. Always good to have you on the panel, Shelly. It's always a joy to be here. And mine will be hearing the letter to the Ephesians. Okay. And John Denzi, head of 3ABN Latino. Good to have you here today. It's a blessing to be here as well. And I believe this is gonna be a life-changing study for us and for hopefully for everyone. And I have Wednesday and it's Ephesians in its time. Okay. And Jill Marconi, our vice president of 3ABN. Always good to have you. Good to have you at the helm. God is working through you in a wonderful way. Do you have any list for us today? <laughs> we have a list. We're going to hopefully get through 16 points. I don't know if that'll happen. I have Thursday, a Christ saturated letter. Wow. Wow. Well, Johnny, would you begin by having our prayer for us this morning? Sure. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with great need of your Holy Spirit. Yes. We pray, Lord, that as we have emptied ourselves of self, that your Holy Spirit will fill us. And we ask you, Lord, to bless us with the words and the message that your children need. We pray, Lord, for a blessing upon all. And we thank you for the Three Avian Sabbath School panel. We mm -hmm. pray that it will continue to be a blessing to your children all around the world. Mm -hmm. We ask you in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen. 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 Yes, I want to just extend a thank you to Dr. John McVeigh. I was, we were in the Northern California Conference together. He was at the Pacific Union College and uh, a pastor there in the Northern California Conference. Now the president uh, and professor of religion at Walla Walla University. And I see his style weaved through the lesson, but much of it is about God's word. And we thank him for that. And we're going to start on uh, week number one, Paul and the Ephesians. I want to share some foundation. Uh, you know, the focus of the book of this study or the book of Ephesians particularly is how to follow Jesus in trying times. And we are definitely living in trying times. Can I get an amen from my amen. choir? Amen. Mm -hmm. We're living in trying times. I yes. mean, that's an understatement to say that right. times in which we're living are trying times. And there are five particular uh, insights that Dr. McVeigh brings out in the very beginning of Ephesians before we actually get to lesson number one, which is Sunday, and I'll talk about that in a moment. First of all, the condition. He says Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, was written primarily to the church at Ephesus mm -hmm. to reveal their condition, to reveal how their condition relates to their strength when they face challenges. Mm -hmm. And in every generation, you know, the people of that generation, they had their last days. Mm -hmm. You know, even the very first church, the church of Ephesus, they had their last days. And even Peter, when on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, he said, this is what the prophet Joel spoke would happen in the last days. So we're living in, as I would refer to it, our last days, hopefully the last last days. Mm -hmm. But Paul talked about how he was concerned about the condition of the church of Ephesus. And it's amazing, this was the very first church. Also the location of the church of Ephesus. The apostle Paul was writing from prison and his focus was to encourage the church and the members not to lose heart. And then he did four metaphoric comparisons. Mm -hmm. He talked about the Christian church in four ways. One, it is the body of Christ. Secondly, it is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it is the living temple. Yeah. And fourthly, it is the army of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's even true today when we read about Revelation 12, 17, the dragon is at war with those who keep the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. So we are in fact an army. Right. Never go into battle 
without your sword. That's right. We are an army. Then fourthly, the purpose of the message. He speaks especially to the people in a generation where the church of Ephesus was in a city that was huge. And there were a lot of allurements in this very popular Roman province, actually in an area now we know as Asia Minor. But um, it had a lot of allurements. Uh, not too long ago, I was in New York City and uh, Ephesus was probably like a small New York City where the church was distracted by the so society in which it exists. Now, those of us here in Thompsonville, you know, we only get distracted by the gas station <laughs> or by Dollar General. But um, it's quite a different story when you try to be a church in New York City or Los Angeles or Detroit or Miami or any major metropolis or Singapore any large city around the world, the allurements are great. You leave church and on the way to church and back, you hear the sound of music, the traffic, you pass the malls, the theaters, it's all around us. And the church of Ephesus was challenged by its society. But he pointed out the central figure for the church of Ephesus is Christ. That's right. And that central figure, Jesus Christ, remains the central figure to the church in every age. That's right. And he encouraged the church members to not only become significant in their acceptance of him, but to stay relevant in the last days, to engage in the mission of the church, become active members. Mm -hmm. And also as they prepared for the return of Jesus Christ to live out their hope. You know, we sing that song, we have this hope, mm -hmm. but what is the hope if you don't live it out? To live out the meaning of your, of your religion, to live out the meaning of your Christianity, to allow Christ to enter every, every area of your life, so that you can find in him the meaningful relationship so that when he comes, that's not the first time you meet him. You meet oh, him on no. your daily Bible studies, yeah. your knees when you pray. You meet him in the miracle moments of your life when things happen that you just think about and you know God was in that moment. The introduction to Sunday is Paul Evangelist All right. to the Ephesians. That's right. Evangelist to Ephesus. And this is Sunday. If you want to turn there with us, if you have your Sabbath school lesson, and I'll read the intro very briefly. In the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul tells us about the Ephesians, first of all, themselves. Years after the exciting events of the early days of the Christian mission to Ephesus, the Ephesians struggle with their significance of their Christian faith. And the first caution, and I think this is true today, don't base your faith on excitement. Mm. Yes. Because a lot of churches today, and this is something that is a, a caution to those of us who embrace the remnant message, the everlasting gospel, so many churches are building uh, their, their church services around excitements. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming, it's becoming more like um, icing on the cake rather than a good solid meal. Mm -hmm. And so many churches are now going after the excitement of religion rather than the dedication of religion. Why was that so significant? Ephesus was a large city, a population of about 250 people. And um, in this particular setting, one of the richest city also, one mm -hmm. of the richest cities. Mm -hmm. And it was a city that had a lot of God worship, mm -hmm. not heavenly God, mm -hmm. but many, many gods. Mm -hmm. uh, Artemis, also known as Diana to the Romans, was the supreme object of worship in that city. And you know, when you think about your Christian walk, what is the supreme object of worship in your life? Is it your religion? You know, religion can become a form of worship and we can miss Jesus. Is it the fabric of your church? Is it the music in your church? Is that the form and focus of your worship? Is it your significance of prophetic understanding? If any of your focuses are not Jesus himself, it is a distraction. And in that city, her worship was the focus of civil ceremonies, it was also the focus of the athletic games. They gave her the praise in the athletic games. And most of the annual celebrations were focused around Diana or Artemis, as I mentioned. And so let's go to Acts chapter 18. Let's lay some foundation. Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 21. And the question that uh, Dr. McVeigh poses in this lesson, what does Paul do on his first visit to Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey? Let's look at Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 21. And it says, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centuria for he had taken a vow and he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent 
but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. Hmm. And he sailed to Ephesus. Now, some things that he did here, you might think, wow, did, did they have to record the forensic parts of his life, like getting his hair cut? <laughs> well, this is something significant because it was a part of his dedication, a part of his vow he made to the Lord. He cut his hair as an act of rededication. And also as a point of seeking guidance from God, he was about to go to a people that had flat out denied Jesus as his messiahship, his divinity. And Paul was going to Jerusalem to the feast, not because of the, of the significance of continued feasts and irrelevance, but he knew that a large contingency of, contingency of Jews would be there. And how can you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel without going to their feasts? So he went there to still hope to present to them Christ and him crucified. Also, when you think about it, let's go to Acts chapter 19. What happened after Paul returned from that missionary journey? It says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. You also find out in Acts chapter 20 how long he stayed there. Let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 31. It says, um, therefore watch and remember that for how many years? Three. Three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, Dr. McVeigh brings out this point. It says, the apostle makes a significant time commitment to Ephesus. While the intention of firmly founding Christianity there, Luke shares the strange story of seven itinerant Jewish exorcists in the city. Mingling the names of both Jesus and Paul in their incantations proves to be a misguided venture for the exorcist. And this is a long story. I may not be able to get to all of it before we go to Ryan, but uh, let's go to Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 20. And I read the verses 18. Well, let me just go <coughs> Acts chapter 19, verse 13 to 20, and I'll switch after this one. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, this is amazing. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Mm -hmm. Which means if you don't have a personal relationship, I cannot witness to you in, in Ryan's <laughs> experience or anybody else's. Mm -hmm. I've got to know Christ for myself. After that, overpowering them and prevailing against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they, and they counted up the volume of them all and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. On that note, mm. I give it to you, Ryan. All right. Thank okay. you so much, Pastor, for that great foundation. I'm Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled, A Riot in the Amphitheater. Mm. And of course, this is diving into Acts chapter 19 and the first part of Acts chapter 20. And I like how the lesson actually provides a, a timeline of, of Paul's connection to Ephesus. And I just want to read that it's, it's highlighted there in the, um, in the lesson. But you can see there that in AD 52, approximately Paul's initial brief visit, he goes to Ephesus for the first time. And when you read about this in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 21. But then by the time you get to AD 53 to 56, this was actually Paul's three years spent in Ephesus in his missionary uh, time there, uh, ministering and preaching and sharing the gospel there in Ephesus. And then, of course, AD 57, while at, um, is it Miletus? How do you say that? Miletus? Miletus. Miletus, okay. While at Miletus, Paul meets with the elders from Ephesus, and that is recorded in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. And, of course, by AD 62, we see some 10 years later after he had that first encounter at Ephesus, Paul composes his letter to the Ephesians, probably from the confinement of Rome. And so uh, the, the lesson actually opens up with this 
this story in Acts chapter 19 of this great riot that uh, took place mm -hmm. in the amphitheater there in Ephesus because Paul was preparing to leave. He's preparing to go on and move on uh, into Macedonia and on to Jerusalem. And of course, he would eventually end up in Rome. But um, after, while Paul is there and he's preparing to leave, uh, one of the townsmen who was a silversmith by the name, by the name of Demetrius, uh, he stirs up the folk. And he begins to, uh, you can read the story for yourself. I'm not going to read all of it. I may, may read some pieces here. Uh, but it's quite interesting. You read this story and he stirs up the people. He says, look, folks, he says, we, we, we've got this incredible, uh, uh, you know, economic way of living and making money. And a part of this, of course, is creating these little gods. He was a silversmith. So what he would do as, a, as kind of an honor or a, a, a praise to the goddess Diana, as a silversmith, he would make these little relics and these little statues uh, of Diana and that people would purchase and they would put it in their home and they would create little home shrines. And this was a, a, a very big business for the goldsmiths and the silversmiths and the blacksmiths and all these different people. And so it's, it's actually highlighted in verse 27 as he's speaking and stirring up the crowd, speaking of Paul. He highlights Paul. This guy has stirred up trouble. He's causing a problem to our business. It says, so not only is this trade of ours, this is verse 27 in Acts chapter 19. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, uh, disrepute, it says, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana, mm. which is also Artemis, uh, may be despised, uh, yeah, may, des may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. Now you have to understand this was their greatest God among many gods. This was their, they had many, many gods. This was a polytheistic um, culture. Uh, but Diana, of course, was a goddess of fertility. She was a goddess of sexual immorality. And this also often led the people to practice in such things. So Paul had to deal with this while he was at Ephesus. He preached against it. He ev evidently uh, discouraged the people from worshiping these gods and worshiping the one true God. And here Demetrius, he's, he's bringing it to the tension and he stirs up the people. They basically uh, rush the amphitheater and they're inside this amphitheater just, you know, again, causing a ruckus, you know, and crying out, great is Diana, the Ephesians. And eventually the whole city just turns into this rioting scene of which eventually uh, one of the local uh, city clerks had to quiet the crowds and say, look, guys, you guys are getting out of control. While Paul may have done some of these things, you know what? We still worship this goddess Diana. Everything's going to be okay. If you have a problem with Paul, take him to court and deal with him there, but do not stop stirring up the people. So it caused a great issue. This story reflects of the struggles and the, tri uh, the trials that Paul had to endure while he was there. Uh, again, not to say that, he w that his work there and his gospel preaching was in vain, but these were some of the challenges he had to deal with. A culture that was so steeped in polytheism and false idol worship, so much that by the time you get to Ephesians chapter 1, and two, and onward, he's writing this letter to the Ephesians and he's expressing his concerns even as he's leaving, he's left Ephesus, he's writing this letter to the, to the leaders at, uh, at Ephesus and he's sharing his heart with them. For instance, if you go to, uh, this is actually in Acts chapter 20, my apologies. So Acts chapter 20 and we're actually in verse 25 and onward. Notice what the Bible says here. This is in the aftermath after he's left Ephesus and he's now sharing his heart with the people and his concerns about what he has uh, in concern for the the people once he leaves because Paul has worked hard to establish order to establish a church there that's going to reach this culture this backwards culture that's so steeped and drowning in in uh, polytheistic uh, false idol worship so in there in verse 25 of Acts chapter 20 he's writing and, and speaking to the church at Ephesus he says and indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more so he's preparing to leave therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. But then he really opens up of his concerns. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember, as Pastor read earlier, watch and remember for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was Paul's concern. Look, I'm going to leave. We've started a good work here, but don't think for one second that after I leave that the devil's not going to send in his tears and they're going to begin trying to divide the flock and to cause trouble and to, you know, divide the church. And I have to just stop here and just make the point that 
I don't think that there is a pastor that has ever existed uh, that, that had a church district or a church that has not experienced this very thing over the years. There's never been a church that has went uh, uh, untouched by the devil's plans to divide and to conquer that congregation. And so these are issues that we also have to pay attention to very much. Now, I, it's interesting that the uh, Monday's lesson ends with this question. It says, what do you think Paul would warn our church about today and why? And as I got to thinking through, while there's many things I'm sure Paul would see going on in the church today that uh, he would probably warn of, I just wrote down a few here that kind of got, it, got me reflecting and thinking of some of the challenges that we may deal with in the culture that we're living mm -hmm. and in the society that we're living and how the devil is trying to divide our church and the mission of our church and to keep it from being accomplished. Uh, for one thing, uh, he, he would probably warn us from falling into the pit of legalism. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a very strong, I mean, there's many minds within the church that have this idea that they feel like they can work their way to heaven, that, that, that they, while the law of God does play an important role in the overall plan of salvation, they believe that it's about what you do rather than who you know and who you know changing what you do. And so Paul would probably warn of that. Don't fall into that pit of legalism. Yes, the commandments are important. Yes, the law is important, but don't come to the point where you think you can add to what Jesus has done. And we're going to see this actually come back up in the book of Ephesians as we study through. Uh, he would probably warn of drifting into the sea of compromise and perversion of the freedom God has given us. In other words, this, this do what thou wilt mentality. It's the extreme opposite of the legalistic approach where people tend to fall into and slip into this mindful thinking of, you know what? Uh, God loves me. You know, love, 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 grace, grace, grace. You know, the, as much as I sin, they'll manipulate Paul's words. As much as I sin, God's just pouring grace on my life and there's nothing that I can do that can separate me from the love of God. That's true that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, but there are things such as sin that can separate us from God and we certainly want to make sure that doesn't happen. Happen. I believe Paul would also warn not to allow spiritual tunnel vision of one minor issue clouding out our vision from the weightier matters, such as the three angels' messages that we are called to preach. But some people get caught up in these other things and they cause division in all these other areas, uh, of the divisions in the church in general. I believe this is a time in which we're living in which the church is divided more than ever. And of course, this is because the, the devil is, he's, he's got wrath and he knows he has but a short time as the book of Revelation tells us. And so he is launching an all out total onslaught on the church to keep us divided, to keep us segmented and fragmented and not together. Uh, he would also probably say, check your spiritual temperature. Uh, don't fall into that Laodicean mindset that many people have. You know, make sure that you are fully grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ. And probably uh, last but not least, he would probably say, you know what? Do regular oil checks. <laughs> Uh, of course, I'm referencing the oil of the Holy Spirit. Right. We are living in the last days where we more than ever need the Holy Spirit. We are told and we are counseled that in these last days that we are living, that the Spirit of God daily is being withdrawn from this planet, not because God wants to leave us, not because God wants to leave us comfortless because He doesn't, but because of our choices and because of our quenching and our resisting of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds and our homes and, our, and with our choices and in our daily lives, God's Spirit is being withdrawn from this planet. So I believe uh, Paul, this great great evangelist, this powerful man of God, Pastor, I believe uh, he would echo that message. Do regular oil checks. Make sure that you have the oil in the Spirit and much of it in your vessels ready to go out to meet him when the times of trouble come and the end of this world is fast approaching, that you make sure that you in harmony with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you're rooted and grounded on the rock of Jesus Christ, and that you are full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. Wow, what a start to our lesson. First lesson, we're getting started. You know that we have three more presenters, but don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Now we're going to go to Shelley Quinn, which has the lesson entitled, Hearing the Letter to the Ephesians. Amen. Thank you so much for that foundation. We're going to spend a whole quarter on six chapters, but my lesson today is to give you an overview of those six chapters in 10 minutes. 
Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians while he was imprisoned. He gave it to his faithful minister who was a uh, beloved brother named Tychicus. So Tychicus takes this letter to the Ephesians. Mm -hmm. This was a big event. I mean, to have Paul's personal representative come to give this letter. As we have looked, influential men in Ephesus were introducing false doctrines. Mm -hmm. So what Paul does, I love the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters are theological in nature, how Christ made them rich. They, they were ignorant of their riches. But then the last three chapters provide practical advice for Christian behavior. And together these six chapters go from eternity past to eternity future. Right. So the theology of chapter one, he opens up speaking of the riches and the blessings that Christians have in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 is one of my favorite verses. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What are those spiritual blessings? Adoption, acceptance, mm -hmm. redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, mm -hmm. the seal of the Holy right. Spirit, life, grace, and citizenship. It's amazing. He says in Ephesians 1, 7, in Him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches mm -hmm. of His grace. Mm -hmm. So as children of God, we become the chosen. We are predestined to become like Christ. Redemption in Christ is the inheritance that we have. We have many resources in Christ. Then Paul goes on in Ephesians 1.17 to pray this prayer for Christ focused wisdom. He's praying for them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. What is that mighty power? It's the Holy Spirit working in us. Amen. The theology of chapter two, Paul speaks to new life in Christ. Mm -hmm. He's saying you were once spiritually dead, now you are exalted with Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. Then he goes on and says, we are Christ's workmanship. We're God's work of art created in Christ for good works, mm -hmm. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the theology of chapter two is talking about unity in Christ, God's mm -hmm. creation of the church out of Jews and Gentiles who are brought together by our being united with Christ mm -hmm. who is our peace. Now, theology of chapter three speaks of God's fullness for the church. Mm -hmm. And the mystery of God's plan is revealed. And I love this prayer, probably my favorite, one of my favorite scripture passages, that Paul is praying for the Ephesians mm -hmm. to experience mm -hmm. the love of God. He says in Ephesians 3, 16 through 21, I'm praying that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you will be, and anytime you see that, there is, that's a purpose statement. Mm -hmm. So I want you to be strengthened with the Holy Spirit in your heart. What's the purpose? So that Christ can dwell in your heart through faith. What's the purpose? That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the width, the length, the depth, and the height to know the love of Christ, mm -hmm. which passes knowledge, that you may be 
filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, Amen. are we filled with the fullness of God? Ah, he says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power, his power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, these are these rich theological themes saying, hey, you're blessed with every blessing in the heavenly realms through Christ. Wake up, recognize who you are, know your identity in mm -hmm. Christ. That's right. And then after those first three chapters, he switches to practical Christianity. In chapter four, he begins with God's plan for the church that it includes that faithful living includes holding on to and nurturing spirit-inspired unity right. as Christ endows us mm. and builds his church. You mentioned how divided things are in mm. our world today. This is not God's way. Mm -mm. God wants unity. He presents, in fact, Paul presents the church as a living organism, as the body of Christ. And he says that all parts are related and independent, that Christ is the head. And we are to follow God's pattern and principles as members of the church, not grieving the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. When we are fighting and dividing and backbiting, yeah. Yeah. we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. Cra the practical Christianity of chapter five is God's standards mm -hmm. for faithfulness in the church. He says, walk worthy of your calling mm -hmm. in unity, in love, <clears throat> living in the light of God's word. Walk as children of the light, he mm -hmm. says. We, light represents the truth, the character of God. We are to avoid darkness, Paul says. Avoid those things that are done in evil. Walk in wisdom filled with the Holy Spirit. And he starts to transition to tell us how to practice Christ-shaped lives in the Christian households. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the covenant relationship of marriage and he compares the church to the bride of Christ and gives God's standards for authority and submission for all members and particularly husbands and wives and households. Now, real quickly, Chapter six, practical Christianity. He's talking about submission of children to their parents, employees to employers, mm -hmm. and he transitions to God's provision. Oh, we love chapter six, don't we? Mm -hmm. For his children's spiritual battles. Mm -hmm. God provides sufficient spiritual armor through his word and by his spirit. Mm -hmm. And we stand together now, Paul says, as the army of God. Mm -hmm. And he explains that the believer's warfare, uh, what it is and what is the believer's arm, armor. Mm -hmm. He says, finally, this is Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. Our, we know that he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness mm -hmm. in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. So he is appealing for vigilant resistance to the devil, to put on the full armor, then he appeals for vigilant prayer in the church. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. The word riches is used five times in Ephesians. The word grace is used 12 times. Glory, nine times. Mm -hmm. Fullness are filled six times. Mm -hmm. And the key phrase in Christ is used 11 times. Christ is the head, the center, and the circumference of the church. Mm. Amen. 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 Uh, amen. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful book. It's the book of Ephesians. Mm. The Holy Spirit has put together a wonderful book for us to study. 
And so I have Wednesday's portion. My name is John Dinsey. The title is Ephesians in its time. This takes us already into Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Let's begin there. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Let's move to verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, that Paul is identifying himself. He says he is an apostle. And normally when you say apostle, people think of the 12 disciples there, the apostles. But here Paul is recognizing himself as an apostle. He has divine credentials. And what is an apostle? It comes from the Greek word apostolos, which means a delegate, an ambassador of the gospel, and it says a, a officially commissioner of Christ, but also it's a messenger, he that is sent. Mm -hmm. So you and I can also be sent uh, as Paul. But Paul is recognizing that he has not uh, claimed for himself that he's an apostle. He has been selected by God. He has divine credentials. Mm -hmm. I, I like to point you to uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because it's very interesting the way that uh, it introduces to us what Paul says. He says concerning himself, and he sets the background there by talking about Jesus, how Jesus was resurrected and he was seen by 500 people, as it says in verse 6, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Let's read verse 7 and onward. Afterward, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of time, for I am the least of the apostles. And I am not sufficient to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Mm. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Mm. And His grace, which was toward me, has not been without fruit, but I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. Amen. or with me. Good. So he's recognizing that God has selected him. He's recognizing that he persecuted the church. He's recognizing that he is, he has these divine credentials. So because he has the grace of God, he labored. And we should consider this as well. We have been selected. Some people have uh, been selected from some horrible backgrounds, but the grace, where sin abounds, the grace of God mm -hmm. more abounds. Right. And this right. is a wonderful thing to consider. And he says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Mm -hmm. And that is his, his credentials. He's coming uh, sent by God. Now he writes, it says, to the saints who are at Ephesus. Wait a minute. You know, you, you hear sometimes of a very popular denomina denomination, that they have these meetings and eventually they, they, call, they, they name somebody a saint. But Paul is saying, he's writing to the saints in Ephesus. Really a saint is one who is, has dedicated his life to the Lord. He's accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and he is willing to follow him. So Paul is recognizing, I'm writing to the saints. And then he says to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Uh, my brothers and sisters, you are saints. You, are been, you have been called of the Lord to be faithful by the grace of the Lord in Christ Jesus. Saints come from the yeah. Greek word hagios, which means somebody that is pure morally. We are only pure morally as Jesus comes into our hearts. Mm -hmm. And we uh, need to recognize we are saints. We have been selected from the world. We are supposed to be lights in the world. And this is our calling. Uh, beautiful things that are written here. He says, grace and peace. We all need grace. Amen. We all need peace. Amen. And Paul is saying to the Ephesians, grace and peace. And by the way, he's writing to the Ephesians, but wait a minute, he's writing to us as well. Amen. We need to recognize that this letter was for the Ephesians, but it's for the saints. Yeah. We are saints in Christ Jesus. He's, right. This letter is for us. This letter it has so much beauty, so much uh, information for us that if we study, 
with a prayerful attitude, our lives are going to be transformed. We are going to understand that is, as you have heard, by grace we are saved through faith. A beautiful, beautiful uh, book in the Bible, Ephesians. So we're going back to the question that is in the beginning of the lesson, how does Paul begin and end his letter to the believers in Ephesus? And what do we learn about his deepest desire for them? Let's go ahead and read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, beginning there. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. And it says, verse 23, peace to the brethren. Again, he brings out peace to the brethren. And love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see similarities in the beginning of the letter and in the end of the letter of Ephesians. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So here he says, comfort your hearts. He has sent Tychicus to comfort your hearts. Do we need to be comforted? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And the Word of God brings comfort to us. Amen. God is the God of all comfort. And, you know, we do ourselves much harm. We kind of say, I say, we punish ourselves by not dedicating time to the study of God's Word. Stop punishing yourself. Go to the Scriptures, study, because there the Lord is going to lift you up and He's going to give you hope. Let's continue here. And it says uh, in Ephesians 6, 23, peace be to the brethren and love with faith. This is Paul's desire that they have peace, that they have the grace of the Lord, that the love of God dwells in them. And it's beautiful. You read that scripture that you may know what? The love of God, which is, oh, it's depths and heights. This, we're going to look into that later on in this, uh, in this study. Uh, here we continue. Uh, I, I need to read something from the lesson. Dr. McVeigh wrote something wonderful here that I'd like to bring out. It says, at the outset of the letter, Paul identifies himself as the author, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Near the middle of the letter, Paul again identifies himself by name, labeling himself the prisoner of Christ mm -hmm. Jesus for you Gentiles. Mm -hmm. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, which introduces a personal reflection on his work as an apostle. Near the end of the letter, he again refers to his imprisonment in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20, and concludes with personal words. Uh, now, he brings out, Dr. McVeigh brings out, that some scholars deny that the letter was written by Paul, but Paul wrote the letter. <laughs> it, he says so in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 he says here, Dr. McVeigh, it is important to note that the epistle clearly lays claim to Paul as its author. Most Christians accept, and rightly so, Paul as the author. And Paul is the author, of course, backing up is through the Holy Spirit mm. that right. Paul was able to write this letter. Mm. Now, something is brought out in the lesson, which is very important as well. And it's, uh, they have a question here. How does Paul worry about the effect of his imprisonment will have on believers in Ephesus? Mm. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. Notice this. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You know, Paul was a servant of the Lord. Paul was uh, an apostle chosen by the Lord, but he also counted it a privilege to suffer for the Lord. Mm. And sometimes as we look at our, our fellow believers and we see them going through things, mm -hmm. some people may be discouraged as they see things happening to God's children. But God is working out something that we may not see on the surface. God is all wise, God is all knowing, and He knows what is best for each and every one of us. And we need to understand that it says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together yes. for good yes. to yes. them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. So, Again from the lesson, Ephesians seems to share the same general timing and circumstances with other letters Paul writes from prison, like Colossians and Philemon. And also consider considerable times seems to have passed since Paul, Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So this letter, 
uh, of Ephesians. This book of Ephesians has a lot in store for us. I encourage you to study and uh, take in. You may want to highlight some of these verses and commit them to memory. And one of those that you should commit to memory, of course, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John, each one of you. What an incredible start to one of my favorite books. Amen. I love Paul's writings. I think Paul and John are my two favorite authors from the New Testament. I love his writings in Ephesians is an incredible book. One of those uh, prison epistles written during Paul's first imprisonment there in Rome. My name is Jill Morricone. I was so excited I forgot to give my name. And on Thursday, we look at Ephesians, a Christ-saturated letter. Mm -hmm. Now, Shelley, you referenced the phrase in Christ taking place 11 times throughout the book of Ephesians. We're going to look at 16 times where we see the phrase either in Christ or in Him referring to in Christ. And there's more, but we're just going to... We don't know if we'll get to all of it, but we'll get to what we can. To me, the beautiful thing about this book is that it's all about Jesus. Right. From the start to the end, Amen. the center and circumference is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll discover this as we go through and unpack these in Christ or in Him phrases. So we're starting in Ephesians 1, verse 3. Read there with me, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What's that word? In, in Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number one, blessings. The spiritual blessings that we discover as we unpack the book of Ephesians, they come in Christ. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we seek for blessings apart from Christ. We think, oh yeah, I can get blessings, I can get, no. Only, they only come through Christ, mm -hmm. in Christ. That's right. Let's look at the next verse, Ephesians 1 verse 4. Just as He chose us, what's that word? In Him, in him that's in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Takeaway number two, holiness comes from being in Him. Amen. or in Christ. Amen. Ryan talked about the legalism that we see prevalent in certain denominations. We think we can become holy in our own strengths. We can become holy in our own works. No, holiness comes from being in Christ. Amen. Let's read verse seven. We're in Ephesians one, verse seven. In Him, that's in Christ, you and I have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Takeaway number three, redemption and forgiveness comes in Him. There is no other name given among men whereby we might be mm -hmm. saved, but right. the Lord right. Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't be saved through trying harder. We can't be Amen. saved through penance. We can't be saved through climbing the stairs on our knees or through some sort of physical torture. We can't be saved through Buddha or Hindu or any of that. We are saved. Redemption comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's read verse 10, Ephesians 1, 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Unity in the church, unity in the family, unity in society only comes in Christ. Mm -hmm. Takeaway four, unity comes in in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, koinonia, Pastor Johnny, okay. and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So many times we seek unity apart from Christ and we say, why aren't we getting along with people? Why is there friction in a relationship? Why is there angst? We only have spiritual fellowship we, when we walk in the light and the other person walks in the light as well. In other words, if you're in Christ and your spouse is in Christ, you can have unity and harmony in that relationship. Unity in the church, in the workplace, in the home comes in Christ. Amen. Let's go down to verse 11, Ephesians 1, 11. In Him, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance. Takeaway number five, eternal life, that inheritance to the saints, it comes in Christ. 
we're only saved, we only have hope of eternal life in Christ. Go down to verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. That reminds me of 1 Peter 2, 9. What does that say? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people, that we should proclaim the praises of him right. who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. What does that mean? This means that you and I can only witness, we can only share what God has done when we are in Christ. Yeah. Takeaway number six, witnessing comes in Christ. You ever wonder why there's not more fruit from your labors? Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that quote and I can't remember it exactly now, but the church, the early Christian church in Acts, if the Holy Spirit was removed, what would have happened? Their work would have fallen apart. They said 95% of the work would have, would have dissipated. But today, if mm. the Holy Spirit were removed, almost everything we have, our plans and our programs and church as we look at it, would continue the same because we are not witnessing as we should mm. in Christ. Amen. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. I think Shelley read this before, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. What is the exceeding greatness of his power, that dunamis, mighty working power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly power, places, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that seated him at the right hand of the Father mm -hmm. in heavenly places, that miracle working resurrection power you and I can have Amen. in Christ. Amen. Take away Hallelujah. seven. Resurrection power comes in Christ. Now we're going over to Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 6. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Without Christ, you and I would not be made alive. We would not be raised from our death in sins. We would not sit in heavenly places. Takeaway number eight, salvation and transformation only comes in Christ. Let's read the next verse, Ephesians 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Takeaway number nine, grace, kindness comes in Christ Jesus. Verse 10, Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Takeaway number 10, sanctification, what we call good works, only comes in Christ Jesus. You know, so many times as Christians, we believe we're justified by faith. Jesus saves us by grace through faith, and then everything else is up to us. Mm -hmm. And we somehow have to become sanctified by our own works. But here it says, those works are created in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. yes. Sanctification, the good mm -hmm. works in the life of the Christian come when you are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let's jump down to verse 13, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near or given access to God by the blood of Christ. Mm. Takeaway 11, reconciliation, restoration comes in Christ Jesus. I love that. The first part of Ephesians 2 is all about vertical reconciliation, reconciling us and God. The rest of it is horizontal reconcil reconciliation, us and other people. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation, restoration of relationships comes in Christ Jesus. Let's go to Ephesians 3 verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, all, both Jews and Gentiles, now have access in Christ. Yeah. We're going to skip number 13 and we're jumping down to 14. We're in Ephesians 4, verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. Growth comes in Christ. 
We only grow when we are in Christ. You cannot grow apart from Christ. Verse 20, Ephesians 4, 20 and 21. You have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Takeaway number 15, truth comes in Jesus. So many times we teach the doctrines. We teach what we believe is the truth and we even push it, but we push it apart from Jesus. Oh, truth true. has to be centered in Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can only share the truth in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Did you cover all 16? Uh, no, 14. Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I'll give you the time to cover those last two. Ryan, what's your final closing thought? You know, thoughts? I just want to remind everyone, check your oil. Check, do an oil <laughs> check. John chapter 16, verse 13 reminds us that the spirit of truth, when he has come, he will lead and guide us into all truth. And that's what he's going to do through this powerful study of the book of Ephesians. So check the oil and make sure you're being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, I believe that Paul's um, practical advice for walking in a way worthy of the Lord and is on, and unity in the church is only possible when we understand what we have in Christ, the adoption, acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit, life, grace, and citizenship. Know who you are in Christ, then you can walk with Him. Yeah. Amen, amen. Well, Paul, desire for the Ephesians, I desire for you, and we desire for you, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jill, give us the last two. Verse. Last takeaway uh, is Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The final takeaway is that you and I can only forgive other people when we are in Christ. Amen. Wow. Amen. You're all 16, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, we're just getting started, and we found that the book of Ephesians is a book that has propped itself up, opened the doors, and said, come on in, and let us find out who we are in Christ, in Him, in mm -hmm. Jesus. The beginning, the middle, the end, the full circumference of this book is all about Christ. This is the grace book. This is the book that enables us. He can do more than we can ever ask or think. This is all in Ephesians. And we're going to continue on our next lesson, which is God's grand Christ-centered plan. But here's a thought to remember as we close out this one. Dedication is not a matter of chance, but a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. What we become is not the focus of our destiny, but the product of our journey. We pray that you'll continue pressing toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Join us next week for lesson number two. And I know that Dr. John McVeigh has a lot more and so does Christ. We'll see you then.